Ready whenever you are. All right, it's seven o'clock. I'm going to kick this off. Good morning, everybody. Uh, today we have a program, the first of our series of Ranching Goats for Profit program. Uh, today we have Dr. Reed Redden with us. Uh, he's a Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service Sheep and Goat Specialist. And uh, we're going to talk about why are meat goats profitable. Uh, real quick, uh, this is a series that we started. Our uh, uh, Southeast Region Small Ruminants Committee uh, has put together this program. And so we're going to have a series of four programs. Uh, we plan on doing this every Tuesday at 7 a.m. Uh, next week, we'll be talking about how to market meat goats with Dr. Sean Ramsey. And then on June the 23rd, we'll be doing Keep Your Goat In, Keep Your Goat In and Predator, Predators Out with Dr. Reed Redden. And then June the 30th, we'll uh, wrap it up with Pasture Nutrition and Parasite Management with Dr. Reed Redden. So again, you can join us at 7 a.m. on Facebook Live at the Brazos Valley Small Ruminants Committee page, which you're on now. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Red. All right. Uh, thank you, John. Appreciate it. Um, pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the team and the Southeast region um, for extension. that's put this program together. I'm really excited to share some information with you all this morning uh, about you know, meat goats and, and the profitability opportunities that exist um, within this. And so, I guess I'm thankful for all the, the platforms that we're able to use. We're going Facebook Live. We're also on Zoom. So the Zoom, we can record it and post it out there on YouTube. And so unfortunately, with all the issues we've had with COVID-19, we've also uh, learned how to use technology a bit better. But uh, for the focus this morning, I'm going to kind of go over three things uh, to to quantify profitability of meat goats. And my primary focus uh, this morning is gonna be the commercial meat goat production aspect. Um, I call them the win-win-wins. Um, when we look at the markets of the meat goats over the last 10 years, um, they've done extremely well, uh, very consistent, very strong, and so we'll talk about those a little bit. Resource management that goats uh, can do for you, how they browse, um, how they can fit in with other livestock and farming systems. Uh, to the benefit of the land, and then also the level of productivity that, that these animals can have and kind of wrap things up. Um, I believe we can kind of take questions as we're going along. I believe John is kind of monitoring our Facebook uh, session here. So if you've got some questions, shoot them in there, and we'll try to address them as we go along. Yes, Dr. Redden, I'll be watching the Facebook. And right now we have, looks like, 32 people joining us this morning. Fantastic. Well, good morning, everybody. All right, well, let's go uh, first thing, the most important thing in this uh, kind of looking at the profitability of meat goats, and that's the market price. Um, Bill Thompson, our economist in San Angelo, does a fantastic job with keeping up with the markets and posting things. Um, if you want to follow his reports and go through those, I encourage you to do so. Um, you can go to sanangelo.tamu.edu and you can find a lot of this data that I've got presented here in this slide. The red line is, is prices in 2020 for meat goats. This is dollars per pound live at the sale barn in San Angelo. And you can see all of 2020, uh, the average uh, meat goat sold has been between $2.75 a pound and three bucks. Uh, the really good ones are selling above three dollars. Um, those that are just a little bit, uh, a little bit staler, need a little extra feed to get to uh, market ready conditions, or a little bit below that. Uh, we're at the time of year where the market's always up. Um, in the winter and spring months, uh, there's generally a, not a lot of goats that come in because they're born in the spring and aren't marketed until the summer. Um, as the volume of goats come in in the summer, that market price will drop. Um, all around 50 or 75 cents a pound. And we see that and it's very consistent year on year. Um, if we flip over and look at a kind of a 10 year trend that's going on, um, the blue line is that price that we kind of reported before. A little different, uh, a little different numbers and you'll have to ask Bill exactly why those are. But the general overall trend, as you can see, is just on a positive incline. Unfortunately, in, in agriculture, lots of times when we see high prices, we see low prices that, that follow them shortly. And that's not really the case with meat goats. They've been on a, on a nice, steady trend. 
Um, that's the blue line that you see. The black line is actually imported goat meat um, carcass price. One of the really good things about the goat industry is the U.S. consumer is paying a premium for them compared to imported products. So now those lines are, are pretty close to each other and the black line is a little bit higher, but that's carcass price. Um, whereas the blue line that I'm reporting is San Angelo's live price, which you can almost double that to get to carcass price and at a minimum. So um, our American consumer is paying almost uh, twice the value compared to import competition goat meat that's coming in primarily from Australia. Here's another graph. And again, we're not going to get into this on Facebook this morning. I just wanted to show you that it's there, um, that you can really pour through the data. Um, this, I don't know if you can see my little cursor here. I might see if I can get a laser pointer going. But the San Angelo kid prices back in 2011. Uh, my dad's very involved in the meat goat business. Um, they market cabrito uh, into different ethnic groups. And, you know, I remember him calling in 2011 saying how good goat prices were. So this was high for how it was historically. And then it's just been on a slow and steady trend over the last 10 years, as you saw in that line. Another good thing about the, uh, you know, the meat goat prices is, is your coal animals. Um, nannies, you see 63 cents a pound back in 2011, whenever it was actually fairly high. And it's just been steadily going up since then. Um, right now in 2020, $1.50 a pound for um, coal nannies at the, at the market. And so uh, the market prices have been going great. So you'd think if the market's going up, that we would see an increase in supply, that more and more people will be raising meat goats. And that's not necessarily true. Um, there's been a lot of people raising hair sheep recently, and I think those numbers have really expanded. Uh, but meat goats, for some reason, just hasn't really taken off. So that's actually a good thing for the markets because as we increase supply, typically um, it'll start to start to saturate demand. The prices will come down. This this graph just shows you the meat goat prices. They've just been steady, or meat goat volume. They've just been steady over the last four or five years. The green bar is all meat goats. There are Angora goats, which are the red bars. Uh, used to be a lot of those in Texas, not so much anymore. And then the dairy goat world is actually growing, albeit quite a bit smaller, the meat goats. Um, if you, you know, grew up in Texas, especially in kind of West Central Texas, um, you, you know, you would probably have seen meat goats in commercial capacity out on ranches. Um, each of these blue dots in the U.S. represents where 250 meat goats are. And as you can see across the U.S., Texas just dominates the meat goat or the, or the yeah, goat industry, really. Um, Texas has more goats than the next 10 states combined. So goat production is just not a common agricultural entity um, outside the state. There's a few states like Oklahoma and Tennessee, a little bit in California, where they're a little bit more popular uh, than they are here in Texas. But in you know, Texas, they are a, a fairly common um, agricultural commodity in the west central part. Um, you get to the eastern part and there's not as many, but there's still probably more there than you would find in other states in and around. So why has the markets gotten so good? And a lot of this has to do with an influx of new consumers. So if you kind of take back and look at this at a, at a bigger picture and look at the world consumption of sheep and goat meat, and I lump these together because there's not just real accurate stuff that's easy for me to tease out. I'm also a sheep and goat specialist, so I like to use the data combined when I can. Um, but as you can see, China is a huge consumer of uh, sheep and meat goat annually um, at you know 8.8 .8 billion tons um, uh, of these products, uh, followed by Ma Mongolia. Uh, and then as you're circling around, you've got India, Iran, Nigeria, Pakistan, the United Kingdom, um, all these countries. And you look in the U.S., and we're just a small sliver here in sheep and meat goat consumption because they're just not common um, products that we eat. Now, this next pie chart is whenever you break that down per person. So, yes, China is a big consumer, but it's a huge country. So per person, um, they consume around six pounds per person per year. 
Mongolia are huge sheep and meat goat consumers at almost 90 pounds of product per person per year. Um, you know, Iran or uh, Nigeria, Pakistan at five pounds. Australia eats a lot, 30 pounds per person. A lot of that sheep um, or lamb meat in particular. Um, you can go through Sudan, Algeria, Syria, South Africa, Ethiopia. You get back to the U.S., we only eat 1.1 pound per person of sheep and meat. Goat. So why is that important? That's mainly important because there's a lot of these countries are um, immigrating into the United States. Um, many of them are, are Muslim by faith, and I'll show that in a minute. And the reason that that's important for sheep and, sheep and goats is, is they are regular consumers of lamb or goat meat because it's a staple of their diet. Um, Williams and others in 2011 did a study and 80% of Muslims eat lamb weekly. I'm not exactly sure what that is with meat goats, but it's probably fairly close. Um, Jewish uh, folks eat lamb at, at 50% of them eat it weekly, uh, whereas Christians um, just don't eat quite as much as often. So when you look at the old world um, and the percent of, of the population that's Muslim, because those are the ones that are the primary consumer of a lot of the goats in the U.S. Um, you know, the Middle East, Northern Africa, a lot of those countries have a really high percent of, of Muslim population. Then you take that into the United States, uh, what states have higher percentage of population? Um, so California, New York, Ohio, Illinois, uh, primarily states that have large metropolitan cities in them. Um, and that's where there's just a heavier population of, of Muslim Americans. And, but it's still pretty small um, in the less than 1%. And so this, is, this data here is a little bit dated. I believe it's about 10 years old. Um, but there was a study by the Pew that's looking into the future. One thing I want to bring to your attention is I still got this pointer up. This was in 2015. Um, here we are in 2020. But by 2050, Muslim Americans are expected to grow to 2%. Um, and so that's basically a double in population. And when they're the primary consumer, you're doubling your consumer. Uh, it's unlikely that we're going to double supply anytime in the near future. So the demand and prices for meat goat are highly likely to remain very strong going into the future. So a very positive outlook. So it's not just about prices. We have to fit your environment. Um, and in Texas, the environment is very suitable for goats. Actually, the environment generally has a net benefit if you have the right stocking rate. Um, here I have a picture of, a, of a, a, someone who do we do a lot of work with. This is the Giles family at the Hillingdon Ranch. And just an example in the hill country, um, if you use goats to manage the landscape, you can have nice, pretty open rolling hills. Um, but this little exclosure here shows where goats could not have get could not get in the last 20 to 30 years. And there's a big old cedar tree growing up. Um, not that cedar trees are necessarily bad, but a monoculture of cedar trees, which you see a lot in the hill country because there aren't as many goats grazing as there used to be. And there's uh, fire has been prohibited is goats can do a really good job of maintaining the landscape if you clear it and get them to start controlling it early. early. And that's because goats are, are, you know, they're diverse browsers. Um, this little chart comes out of what uh, range herbivores eat and why by Rick Machen and Bob Lyons. Um, and if you look at a goat, it, it generally likes to consume about half of its diet from browse. So browse would be leaves of woody trees. Um, with uh, a portion of their diet in forbs and some in grass. Contrast, if you look at beef cattle, uh, beef cattle prefer to eat about an 80% diet of grass. And so um, goats really fit in well with cattle because they don't have as much of a diet overlap. Um, at Texas A&M, AgriLife um, research out here in San Angelo and Sonora, we've actually developed uh, um, Aggie cedar eaters. This is a line of meat goats that um, eat 
somewhere in the neighborhood of twice as much cedar as a regular goat would, would eat through breeding and selection goals. And so if you really want to be a targeted grazer and provide a grazing benefit, or really wanted to work on controlling your cedar, I'd highly recommend you get in touch with us and get some of this genetics into your, into your herds to help you with managing um, your cedar problems. But it's not just browse, weeds are also, um, you know, something that, that goats can do a pretty good job of. You know, I, I'm a biased person, I'm a sheep and goat guy, but, uh, you know, I, I go to a lot of these rain, uh, livestock meetings and there's a lot of folks selling chemical to spray and kill, um, you know, whether it's browse or brush or weeds and everything else. And, you know, quite often those are very palatable products that sheep and goats will eat. Uh, mesquite's not one of those, unfortunately. Sheep and goats will eat the seeds, uh, but but they're not going to eat the leaves. But here in this picture um, on the left is this is out out of Menard. Um, on the left is where we, we constantly graze um, cattle. So this is a cattle part of the ranch, and on the right is a sheep and goat part of the ranch. And so at first glance, you can see it, you would think it's kind of overgrazed on this side, but it's in the middle in the heat of the summer and it hadn't rained. And this is just what the country looks like that time of year. This so over here looks a little bit greener, but if you look closely, it's all broom weed. Um, you look on the right side, there's almost no broom weed. And so sheep and goats can control this broom weed um, if they get on it at a very early stage. And so, you know, instead of spraying chemical to kill this broom weed, you can have a diverse grazing um, and graze the broom weed back so it doesn't cover up the grass that comes in and grows. And we've got some other operations that are generally farmers that really fight pigweed. Some of these have, have uh, gone back and reintegrated sheep and goats in their operations. I have a farmer that always, you know, he's got his comment that I used to spend $20,000 a year on chemical to spray pigweed, and now I'm running sheep and making $20,000 a year grazing this. Um, during the times that I don't have those crops out there. And especially as people going back to organic and can't use um, you know, herbicides as much um, because of those high, high commodity prices for organic things. And to get there, they're using sheep and goats to graze these weeds and things out there in their fields uh, in between crops. And so there's a lot of opportunity if you kind of open your eyes and look out what's going on. Solar farming and grazing underneath solar farms is very popular now. Um, you know, it's something that you see more and more and, and most people actually get paid to graze their animals under these. Unfortunately, meat goats may not be the best for solar farms because they're probably going to jump up and try to climb up on these. Uh, a sheep is probably a little bit better suited for that. But I just show that just to kind of stimulate some ideas for you to think, OK, where are those resources for me to graze the animals? Um, you know, sheep have kind of done more of this across the U.S. because sheep are more common. Uh, they run sheep, sheep a lot in California and vineyards and other places during the off season. It was over here on the right or even during the growing season uh, where they may have netting or something to keep the animals from, from eating the leaves and such. I did see this uh, little contraption they put on a sheep. I'm not sure real sure how well it worked and just thought it was kind of funny that this little contraption as it raises its head up the muzzle comes down as its head goes down the muzzle goes up so it can eat grass but it can't eat browse probably wouldn't work for a goat goats are very smart animals and would, would be able to overcome that um you know another big opportunity for goats is uh, small acreage landowners uh sheep and goats fit into small acreages fairly well because you can have you know, 10 females and a male on, on say 10 or 10 acres or so. Um, whereas if you had cattle, you may only be able to have one cow. How are you going to get a bread unless you're AI? And so there's challenges with having larger livestock species on small land, land bases. Not to say that there's not challenges with raising small ruminants as well. And we'll get into that later in this uh, webinar series. But this first one is just kind of focusing on the profit opportunities. Here is a, a great fact sheet if you want to do some reading up on livestock for small acreage landowners written by Rick Machen and Bob Lyons. Um, so just search livestock for small acreage landowners. You should be able to find that online. Okay, the, the last win the, um, is the productivity of these goats. Um, primarily their ability to raise multiple offspring. Always kind of the buy one, get one. You know, we're going on to a flash though where you go buy one, you get one for free. 
you know, beef cattle, which is very common in Texas. Um, a cow generally always raises one calf. You do see some twinning that goes on, but it's not all that common. In meat goats, it's very common. Um, actually, there's been a little bit of research out of, out of uh, Tennessee, and I just show this because this is a, you know, southeast Texas where it's kind of more hot and humid. And there's some research that showed the Spanish goat um, across all does exposed raised 1.5 kids per doe. So more than half are, are raising twins to get um, that high of reproductive efficiency. Uh, the boar goat, unfortunately, uh, raised less than one per doe. Um, it's a bigger, thicker, meatier, faster growing goat, but hadn't been uh, maybe not quite as hardy, not as well able to manage um, the parasite load and, and take advantage of the feed land race goat for Texas. Uh, but then again, a Spanish boar cross would probably do quite well as well. Kikos are very popular, uh, just slightly less productive than the Spanish goat, uh, but maybe a little bit bigger and faster growing, so they might be able to overcome that. And so, you know, from a productivity standpoint, they they raise twins, um, they get those the offspring to market or are, are being weaned, you know, around 90 or 100 days of age, and they're pretty close to market ready conditions because the consumers are wanting these goats around 50 to 60 pounds. And so there's not a long time you've got to hold on to them uh, to be able to get that product back. Um, you know, when you have those short, short lactation seasons, once those, those animals um, or those young offspring are weaned off of them, you can get those goats back into condition. They're fairly easy to manage um, if you can keep them fenced in once they don't have the young on them. And uh, sheep and goats are, are always a little bit more challenging uh, during the, the kidding and lactation season. There may be some other livestock species, but they're very easy to manage during the other part of the seasons as well. This is the last slide I'm gonna kind of really share with you this morning. Um, and it, it is some data that um, our economist put together. And he went through and, and looked at all the conditions that, that sheep, goats, and cattle are dealing with. And he separated wool sheep and hair sheep out. And he looked at um, the market price for them, uh, the amount of, of feed inputs that we're taking, the amount of lease land it required to run the animals, um, all those, it looked into predator control, you know, fencing management, all those things, put them into this equation and projected a, a net return per animal unit, you know, because sheep and goats are small. Um, you generally run about seven goats per cow for an animal unit basis and around, uh, five sheep per cow on an animal unit basis. So if you're comparing seven goats to one cow or five sheep necessarily to one cow, and you look at the net return, meat goats just killed everybody else. Uh, meat goats were generating a return of $300 per animal unit. And again, this is commercial settings. You know, you might be raising some, um, you know, show goats that you're selling kids for $2,000 a piece. You think this is way under, um, underestimating what, what I can generate. And, and I don't disagree with you at all. This is just a really commercial look. But there's so many people running cows, which, you know, I, I appreciate the beef cow industry. I'm not saying they shouldn't be, but some diversity in small ruminants, uh, particularly meat goats in, in the ag settings that we have right now um, should be something that, that everyone should really look at, especially if they've got some browse and weeds that they're having a difficult time managing. Um, these animals can be very profit oriented. We'll go through the rest of the week. They're a little bit different in nutrition. Um, definitely have to manage predators and parasites and keep them fenced in. And we'll go over those throughout, uh, throughout the, the month here. So with that, John, I'm going to turn it back over to you and entertain any questions. Before I do, I would just like to plug our own Facebook page, uh, facebook.com, Tamu Sheep and Goats. Um, we post things almost daily there. I've also got a, a blog that I write monthly at a website that you can sign up for. It's agrilife.org slash sheep and goat. And then we're also growing our Instagram channel at uh, agrilife.sheep.goat. So, John, we got any questions or things come in on Facebook Live? So far right now, Dr. Redden, I don't see any questions. We do have uh, 56 viewers right now. 
And um, they've been scattered across the state of Texas, it looks like, from Bronson, Texas, to Jasper, Texas, to Waller and San Angelo. So we got a pretty good widespread. Uh, cool. I'm going to watch it real quick to see if we have any last-minute questions come in. Uh, be sure to ask them, and we'll let Dr. Ed and I answer them for you. Just have somebody, uh, Shirley Kilgore said hello from New Braunfels, Texas. While we're waiting for something to come in, this is a new project that we're doing. You see these goats are wearing collars. They're actually uh, Bluetooth devices called Smart Shepherds. And so one of the challenges we have with breeding and selection for commercial goats that kid out in the pasture is we don't know which kids are raised as singles and twins. And so um, this is one of the things maybe why boar goats have a lower reproductive rate than Spanish goats. The Spanish goats haven't been selected um, maybe against reproduction because they're always selecting the biggest, which are single, is we will go through and put these Bluetooth collars on the does and the kids and turn them out for 48 hours and get them back and pull them up together. And the Bluetooths talk to each other. And then it can, because the kid goats will be next to their mothers, it can uh, assign parentage. Uh, still working through the details on this, but um, kind of encouraged about it. That's pretty neat. Pretty neat deal. Um, Dr. Ed, I've got one question. Um, okay. It says, uh, how will getting the meat into grocery stores affect this? And I guess the, 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 the first question I didn't see her. Uh, yes, it's a, uh, I guess she's talking about maybe the Bluetooth. I'm not sure what she's talking about. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think getting meat, uh, goat and or meat, goat meat into the grocery stores um you know it, it's always good to have more demand uh, but, but right now the, the meat goat industry is kind of built on um i guess he's talking about maybe the bluetooth that would be a little bit of feedback i'm hearing your um, oh i'm sorry your phone your phone coming in through that john um but i think what what's going on or how the meat goat kind of supply chain works as so these goats are generally sold at at um, auction markets or direct to the consumer or those that are actually auction market are going to you know central locations or harvest facilities and, and a lot of times the harvest facility is selling direct to the consumer um, and they're buying the whole carcass generally um, or big pieces or chunks of that carcass and so uh, and there's 300 million Americans. And so if you think and you want to get it in the grocery store to increase consumption, um, if you just had a fraction of increase, uh, we would never be able to supply. It. And so there's fantastic markets for meat goats, especially out West right here where we've got the auction barns and the infrastructure set up. And I think next week, uh, Dr. Ramsey is going to talk about marketing meat goats in the you know Eastern part of Texas where the, the sale barns are and is, um, they're, they just don't, they just don't market because the volume of goats is not as high in those regions. And so I work through that, but you know, to me, marketing is not, we don't need to all, all the way to the consumer. There's already a built in consumer that's paying a huge premium for it. And so, um, and, and I'd be and, concerned about trying to build too much of a demand because we can't supply it now. And I think you answered her, her second question. She asked point. Uh, the point is we're not seeing meat and goat goat meat in the uh, grocery stores. Right. At a grocery store level, goat meat would be probably close to $20 a pound. Um, maybe not that high, but that's like the whole carcass. Um, so if you sold some of the better cuts at a higher level, it would be even more than that. Cause I mean, they're selling for $3 a pound on the hoof. Um, and you're going to add a dollar a pound for, the harvest fee or slaughter fee. Um, and then the price from $3 a pound is going to double because they're only going to hang half that weight. So now we're at six, seven, uh, marketing and distribution at, you know, 20 to 30%. Now we're 10, $10 a pound 
for the whole carcass. And so I think the reason they're not in a lot of grocery stores is it's not a common product that people eat. Plus, it's hard to get people to move over to a new product at ten dollars a pound when it's still bone in. You know, so if you if you went boneless with that product, you know, the, it might even be closer to twenty dollars a pound. And so um, there's a great consumer for me, Gouts. Um, the prices are really strong. Uh, I think that what I would, if I'm looking at raising them, my main focus is how do I gain access to as much feed resources and land resources as I can? And how can I be as efficient at producing them as possible? Because the markets are there. That sounds good, Dr. Red. And I have another question. And by the way, um, we have a hello from Humboldt, Kansas. Uh, we also have someone from... Uh, uh, Armando Gomez from California. He says he has a commercial dairy goat herd there. Awesome. And another question we have is if you would have a larger cedar area to clean out, how long approximately would it take for goats to clean the area out? Uh, let's say 30 goats. Yeah. So um, we, we, I can send some people some fact sheets on that. Goats will eat about a half a pound um to a pound of that a day um the younger the plant is the better uh we've got some data on the amount of forage on a tree but generally if the trees are much taller than three feet um and you put a lot of goats in there they'll kind of clean it up a little bit but they may eat everything else what a person really ought to think about doing is cleaning the place mechanically or with fire um, removing the trees and using a light to moderate goat uh, browsing management plan to keep that brush from coming back the next time. Because often when there's a lot of trees, the amount of goats that it takes to clean up the trees, they eat everything else too. Perfect. And if they will uh, email me at uh, read.redden at ag ag dot tamu dot edu um, i'd be glad to send them um, some some data on that where they can kind of make that calculation out okay and we have a question from uh, looking to start a small profit herd choice of goat breed choice of breeding versus buying small Um, yeah, I mean, I, it all depends on the goals of the operation. Smaller operations often aren't that profitable. Uh, my always rule of thumb is you need 50 animals for it to generate enough money to kind of cover some of your overhead, like, um, you know, having an older pickup and an older trailer to move things around and buying drench guns and things like that. Um, you know, before they cover the overhead on things and you need really probably 300 head before it justifies, you know, a lot of the time that you put in it so that you're generating profits from it. Now it can be something that you really enjoy doing and, and you can make it work. Um, you know, Spanish goats are the most fertile, uh, meat, the, the boar, uh, red headed white body generally get the most value at the market. Um, so generally what we would recommend is a Spanish doe herd or a Spanish boar cross herd. Um, and, and those generally have the, the highest level of production. Um, you know, if you wanted to get into marketing straight Spanish, the Spanish breed uh, conservancy group is, is getting together. And so you might be able to sell some high value animals or, you know, the show goat, the, the club goat markets are really expensive. Um, so if you have the skill set to be able to raise the right kind of goats for, for kids in those market projects, um, you can do very well, but it's, it's also very expensive to get into that entity, you know, and buy those. So it all depends on their goals and what they want to do. If they just want to raise a few animals, um, take care of their land, um, and, and sell some goats to uh, an auction barn or direct market them to some friends and families or neighbors or whomever they can market it to probably a Spanish boar cross is going to be the best for them. That's a real good point, Dr. Ed. And I think, you know, uh, 
it's really important to kind of have an idea of, of number one, what your facility size is and, and how much land you have and, and what your capabilities are. And then I guess it's like we tell the kids and, and on their projects as well as everybody else's kind of set you a budget and set you a goal and kind of see where you want to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but the most common mistake people make is they overstock, you know, they have, um, you know, they have five acres and they want to raise 50 goats. Um, and, and you know, those acreage just cannot support that. Now, I'm not saying you can't raise 50 goats on five acres, but within that five acres, you need a dry lot area where you keep the goats um, and then just let them out to graze whatever uh, forage you have available. When you don't have forage, you're going to have to buy feed or hay or something like that. If not, you know what, John, what's the general cow stocking rate in your area? How many acres per cow? Uh, we we kind of look at three to five. Um, and, and it's just dependent on the, the, the grass and, and, and the type of pasture. And, and I think you that's a common mistake. You say, uh, we, we, we usually look at about three to five acres per head, um, on the safe side. Yeah. Yeah. You kind of broke up a little bit, so I didn't hear you exactly, but. I said you broke up a little bit. I didn't hear you, um, you know, what your exact numbers are. But let's just say if it's 10 acres per cow and a higher rainfall. Out here, it's it's closer to, you know, 30 acres, depending on where you're at. And, again, you know, if it's 10 acres, um, you know, per cow, um, you know, you could run, um, say, five to seven goats on that 10 acres. Uh, and, and generally, when people have 10 acres, they're going to have a lot more than that five to seven number um, well dr radden we've uh we've made you a uh, international star we have uh nancy pratt from australia watching us today oh very good and uh, so i think you um looks like that's all the questions for today um we want to be sure and, and tell everybody that uh and or, or Reinform everybody that this is a uh, ongoing series. Uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Um, next week we'll have Dr. Sean Ramsey at Texas A&M uh, to talk about marketing and uh, of your goats. And so we want to be sure to to follow us on our uh, Brazos Valley Small Room and Committee page and uh, Dr. Redden's Facebook page as well. And uh, we'll be providing a lot of great information. Uh, You've seen Dr. Redden's contact information on there. Uh, also, feel free to contact any of your county extension offices. Um, and they, uh, we all, as uh, county extension agents, we have a direct line to Dr. Redden as well. And uh, so we can help you in, your, in all your needs. So uh, feel free to contact any one of us at any time. And I think with that, Dr. Redden, I think... Uh, We'll wish everybody a good day. Be sure to stay cool because it looks like we're having some, I don't know what your temperature is out there in West Texas, Dr. Redden, but it's supposed to be another 100 plus degree day here in Central Texas. Yeah, it's going to be a hot one. All right, well, we'll look forward to seeing everybody next week. Y'all have a great week. Thanks, John. Take care. Thank you, Dr. Redden. All right, we're down. We still got.